How does the Master Forge compare to a market leading keyboard? How does it compare to something like the Caracorder 1? Today I'll be answering all those questions as we reveal the specs for the Master Forge for the first time ever. This is week 27 of Caracorder updates every week until the whole world can type at the speed of thought. I'm really stoked to dig into today's video because I feel like there's just not that many people out there yet that fully grasp how insane of a device the Master Forge actually is. Even people that have backed the project at the Forge Keyboard website, you'll probably learn something new today. I'm gonna break this video down into three categories of specs. We have computational, we have electrical, and we have mechanical. And then there's also three columns uh, for three different devices that I'm going to be focusing on. The Master Forge, of course, and just showing how that measures up to the Caracorder 1 versus also a market-leading keyboard. I want to start out in the computational category because I feel like for people that are maybe seeing this for the first time, this will be a great place to sort of understand what Caracorder actually is. It's pretty standard these days for a high-end keyboard to have individually programmable keys. But with the Master Forge, in addition to programmable keys, you also have programmable key combinations. The best way to understand this is to think of a musician. Like what if a pianist was only allowed to press one note at a time rather than being able to combine different notes together? The level of creative depth that chording adds to music, it also can do the same with human-computer interaction. And that also is why there's such a huge disparity in the number of possible inputs on a CCOS powered device compared to a market leader. This has around 100 possible inputs with Caracorder 1. And with the Master Forge, you have over 13 billion possible inputs. And when a lot of people see that 13 billion number, their initial response is, all right, that's kind of cool, but I would never actually need 13 billion possible inputs. And yeah, that's, that's kind of the point, is it's infinitely expandable in an infinite number of directions. So you never have to worry about pruning or sacrificing a slot when you want to build out some sort of automation. You can have a single stroke input for every word that you've ever learned in your entire life since birth. You can have one for every function or every feature in every single piece of software ever developed for the history of humankind. You can have a unique possible input, single stroke input, for every single human being on planet Earth and still have billions left over, which is just cool to have all of that at your fingertips without them even breaking contact with the device. And if that's not OP enough, there's a 240 megahertz dual core processor inside this thing, and everything is embedded within its driverless operating system. So you never have to download anything to your computer, and you're never sacrificing your host computer's resources. When we think about Forge, we really want it to be your tangible bridge to all of your digital worlds and something that you can really wield as a true extension of yourself. So having everything embedded is really powerful because it means that you can pick that device up and you can take it with you and no matter what it's plugged into, you're gonna have the same exact consistent performance in the same field, that same interface, no matter when and where you use it. There's also an amazing embedded set of tools to help you with configuration like impulse cording and generative text menus. So you never even have to like change windows when you wanna build out an automation or add a new cord to your device. But for those that do want to use that GUI style interface, there's a web-based manager that is also beautifully designed if you just go to manager.carecorder.com. Another thing that I really love about our company and our products is there's an open serial API specification so you can build your own web tools to interface with the device. You can even build your own CCOS powered device from scratch using Caracorder Engine and there's no commercial limitations for what you can do with that. Next up we have electrical. If you spend any time in the keyboard enthusiast community, you've probably heard of in-key rollover. But this is a little bit of a misnomer, actually. A lot of keyboards that advertise in-key rollover can actually only support up to six simultaneous key presses. So basically what in-key rollover is, and how it's usually implemented, is you place a diode on your uh, circuit board in parallel with each of your switches. And the first Caracorder prototypes that we ever built, uh, we, we just used this, what is widely used in the keyboard industry. 
Uh, however, the challenge that we ran into is that even if you're, um, you can prevent occlusion on the hardware side, you're still only limited to six keys based on the limitations of USB HID communication protocols. This is probably the least creative marketing term ever invented, but instead of calling our keyboards NK Rollover, I've been calling them NK Rollover Plus. Instead of having a traditional key matrix, they have a anti-matrix with a dedicated channel and a dedicated pin for every single switch. And also, instead of using that uh, six key HID keyboard schema, we're using an extended 12 key schema. The last spec here, but certainly not the least, is that every anchor body in the Forge keyboard ecosystem has USB hub functionality. So in this case, both my left and my right half of the Master Forge here have a one USB-C port for power input and then three USB-C ports for that I can just plug in whatever I want. And that can be something that's a part of the Forge ecosystem or something completely outside of it. So yeah, these shoulder ports and these rear ports aren't just because they look awesome. There's a cavity underneath the device and um, these two USB-C ports in the back, you can plug in any of your accessories, feed the cables out of those ports and then bail it up inside. Let's see actually if I lower the tripod here, you can probably see, there it is. And that's a great transition to our final category, the mechanical specs. The Master Forge is more compact than the Caracorder one, and of course, both of these devices are significantly more compact than a full-size mechanical keyboard. And the reason why they're able to be more compact but still have all of the inputs is mostly because of the switch style here. So rather than using one-dimensional switches, uh, both the Master Forge and the Caracorder one use three-dimensional switches. So basically, instead of a traditional typewriter or keyboard switch, which you can only activate in the Z axis up and down, you can also access it in the Y axis and in the X axis. One thing that I think is really important to mention here is that even without all of the computational specs and all the electrical stuff that we've covered so far, this is still a great keyboard replacement, and I would still drastically prefer this over a normal keyboard. It's also important to point out that even though the design of these three-dimensional devices that I've covered in this video are centered around having the fluid corded character entry capabilities, you don't have to use three-dimensional inputs in order to benefit from those capabilities. That's why uh, like Caracorder Lite and Caracorder X exist. You can still apply that same technology to the QWERTY layout, that's no problem. There's also a pretty major difference in the style of switch that we're using in the Caracorder 1 versus the Master Forge. So the Caracorder 1 has switches which are called five-way tactile switches, which is like an off-the-shelf component that can already move in all of the directions that we need, whereas the Master Forge switches, these are snap action switches. They're more expensive, but they give us a lot more flexibility in terms of what we can do with the design and how we can um, customize things like the actuation force, which is a little bit trickier to measure for three-dimensional switches than one-dimensional. So for one-dimensional switch, all you gotta do is take your force measuring device and just slowly uh, push in on that switch until you experience the activation. So this is about 60 grams of force to activate one of these switches. So on the underbelly of this exoskeleton, there's some geometry sculpted in there to allow a, a custom designed stem as well as the cap to, um, to sort of roll around inside of there. And you have to consider that the stem as well as the cap are going to act as a lever arm. So that'll significantly change the measurement that we'll get with our device compared to the raw electrical contact. So all you gotta do is press it into the switch as if it is your finger. So that's about 57 grams. And the last spec we have on here is the expansion interface. Of course, every keyboard in the Forge ecosystem has that aluminum dovetail railing along the full outer perimeter of the device. So you can attach any number of electromechanical bolt-ons, some of which will even enhance some of the specs we previously covered in the others. The last thing I'll leave you with today is to announce that the official campaign launch for the Master Forge will be this month, we are in that home stretch. Thank you so much to everybody who's already backed the project. 
at forgekeyboard.com. And of course, to everybody that watched this video, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something and I'll see you next week.